awesome, but how about I give you 110 additions by today, 110 additions in God's church. We say, God, let at least 90 of those be via baptism. As of today, with Austin being baptized, we would have seen 94 people get baptized in 2021. We celebrate God's incredible news. We celebrate his favor. But I really believe it's a prelude of what we saw this year of what God wants to do through all of us in 2022. Which is why it's so important that we begin to prepare for it today. We don't begin to prepare for it when the clock hits midnight on December 31st. If you're strong today, get stronger. If you're bold today, get bolder. If you're filled with God's spirit inside of you, get more spirit filled. If we're going to achieve what God wants to do through us in 2022, it's not up to Nate and Sam Pavone. It's not up to Chris and Jessica. It's not up to Job and Aaron. It's not up to Bob and Barb or Hugo and Paulina or the rest of your leaders. The call is upon all of us. To increase greatly. My first point. Increase your perspective. Genesis 17. We're going to start right at the beginning. It's a good place to start. Genesis 17. Verse 1. Increase your perspective. 
when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him. See, if you don't believe that God could call you in your older years, you are deceived. I, I can't think of anyone in this room that is 99 years old. There might be a debate, but at least not that I know. Check it out. God appears to him and says, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will affirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be a father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you. And kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. To be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you are now an alien I will give as an everlasting possession to you and to your descendants after you. And I will be their God. You know, you and I are familiar with Abraham. But Abraham wasn't always Abraham. Abraham was Abram at one point. Who was Abram? God had called Abram to go to Canaan while he's living at home. He wasn't getting a brother's household, if you know what I'm talking about. His faith wasn't just there just yet. He was at home with his father. And he did not make it to Canaan. He fell short. Genesis chapter 11, we find that on his way to Canaan, he settles in the land of Haran. And yet this is who God decides to use to give his everlasting covenant for the generations to come. Who does he decide to use but Abram the settler? Abram the sentimental. Abram, the faithless. Abram, the comfortable. Abram, the tanker. Genesis chapter 12, he answers the call. But after he answers the call, God wants to see, all right, do you really want to do this, Abram? And God puts him to the test and he sends a famine his way. And if you ever want to test somebody, just get them hungry. Because when they're hungry, oh, man, everything comes out. Try this this uh, coming week if you live in a household. Go eat all your roommate's food. Now, they can't get bitter at you because I told you to do it. So you go. And you know where their special stash is at. Because they'll, they'll put in the covers like the bread and some other general stuff. But there's a special stash in their room. So if I'm you, as soon as service is over and after the bathroom is over, I'm rushing home. Does Abram, when God sends them this test, and here's the thing, when God, when you feel tested in your faith, it is God Almighty sending you that test. God sends them the famine. Does Abram rise to the occasion and give everyone a high five because of the great level of his faith? Sadly, no. He runs to Egypt. He's attracted by the great prosperity in Egypt. And he goes to the point that he lies about his own wife 
And he said, well, this is my sister. And he puts his own very wife in a compromising position with the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh finds out, and he is perplexed. He is uh, angry at the fact that he put him in this position. At this point of Abram's life, his marriage is tanking. Sarah does not respect Abram at this point. He has a lack of conviction. Because she starts spiraling spiritually as well, and she wants to have a child. She's like, look, Abram, I'm tired of your lack of conviction. Why don't you sleep with the concubine and give me a child? And Abram's like, okay. (laughs) Abram being a noodle. This is who he was. He was a noodle. He did not lead his wife. And what happens? They give birth to Ishmael. This creates a lineage of people called the Palestinians that till this very day, they're at war with the people of Israel. A lack of spiritual leadership will always lead to strife. Don't look at your wife and see how disrespectful she is. Don't look at your wife and see how unloving she is. Just look at yourself in the mirror, your lack of spirituality, my brother. We lead our households. And Abram failed to do that. His lack of godliness. But yet at the age of 99, Who does God decide to call in chapter 17 but Abram himself? God starts off, let me remind you, I am God Almighty. I will confirm my covenant between you and me. I will stamp it. Abram at this point could not fathom or understand Logically, this argument made no sense. Why would he pick me? I mean, you look at my track record. I mean, just yesterday, I lied about my wife. He's perplexed. My decisions have been poor. My leadership has been poor. And what does God say? As for me. As for me, here's what I think about you, Abram. You Yes, you will be a father of many nations. Here's the thing, Abram. I'm switching your name. You're going to be the father of many nations. I'm going to give you a new beginning. I'm going to rewrite the chapter of your life going forward. But I need you, Abram, to increase your perspective of who you are to me. You will no longer be called Abram. In the Hebrew... It means exalted father. As an individual, Abram had limited influence. And what does God decide to do but change his name to Abraham, which means father of many nations? He said, I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations come out of you, kings to come out of you. I'm going to put you, Abram, in a position where you're going to influence the masses. Now, we understand from chapter 21... That God approaches Sarah and he says, God was gracious with Sarah. God was gracious with Abraham. But why? Why does God continue to believe? Why does God continue to want to use him? Why not just pick somebody else? Why doesn't God just simply move on from you and me? Let's look at Luke 15. If we're going to increase greatly and prepare, we have to increase our perspective. Luke 15, verse 4. Jesus trying to help explain to mankind, to fickle people like you and me, who his father is. 
And what his heart looks like. If he can give us a lens of how he sees his father. He tries to convey this in verse 4. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep. And loses one of them. Does he not leave his 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. The God of the Old Testament The God Almighty that was calling Abraham and switched his identity to Abraham. It is the same God that Jesus is describing here. Malachi 3.6 says the Lord does not change. If I have 99, I'm not satisfied, God says. We know that number 10 means completion. A hundred means greater completion. A thousand grand completion. When God sees his people and one disciple not doing well and and drifting away, it is not complete. I am willing. As for me, I'm willing to go to the open country. I'm willing to get on my knees, the almighty, the alpha, the omega. I'm willing to be like that woman who's looking for her last coin. I will put my life at risk if that's what it takes. And that's what he did. I will do anything and everything to find you and bring you back home. As for me, you're just that valuable. But now, I need you to stop fighting me. I need you to stop ignoring me. I need you to stop deferring me. I'm actually going to throw a celebration for you. I'm actually going to call people in and rejoice with me. And put you on my shoulders. Just like a father would. Put his child on his shoulders. With this parable, Jesus is trying to communicate to you and I who he truly is. Not what the world has defined God to be. Not even the religious society has defined God to be. But who God really is. About 10 years ago, I had gotten myself spiritually stuck. I had spiritually spiritually plateaued and began to decline. I had stopped having my quiet times. I had stopped sharing my faith. Anytime you drift from the vine, everything around you will begin to have collateral damage. My marriage was not the greatest. I had gotten myself in a position where my character, and all the years up to leading to that point, my character had gotten stronger and began to deteriorate. It began to go the opposite way. I knew what I wanted, but I felt too weak. Still in the church, in our former fellowship, I was not growing. I was actually dying. Thankfully, in 2014, God's incredible mercy and sovereignty puts me in touch in in a way that I had no involvement. Where I come across real sold out disciples of Jesus Christ once again. And they put the same spirit inside of me. And when I came into the new movement, I got restored. I heard a whisper from God. I'm not done with you yet. God said to me, as for me, I specialize in weakness. I can raise the dead. I can revive. I can and I want to use you. Seven years later. My marriage has never been stronger. My faith 
my joy, my character has greatly increased. Now by the power and mercy and grace of God, I'm an overseeing evangelist over the great state of Texas. I believe that God will use me to bring out kings, leaders who will go to the nations, who will go to all the United States of America, not because I am anything, but because as far as it involves him, he is willing to still use me and you. This is who he is. Decide to increase your perspective of who God is and who you are to him. Then and only then will you greatly increase. Then and only then will your character change. Then and only then will you go to greater height you've never been to before. Some of you don't even understand the potential that you have. But you have to first increase your perspective. What is the right perspective? It's always dropping yours and grabbing his. See, that's why I don't really understand someone who drags their feet to get right with God. Worried about finals. Worried about their education, about their job, about money, about their family. All these things in a dry, special way have, are noble. But the perspective is off. This God that we're reading about is not their God. In the Hebrew, God Almighty means El Shaddai. Which means the God who is sufficient. And boy, has this challenged me in the past month. And it's not where I've been at. As I have encountered health issues. And I've struggled to work through them. In moments where I should be drawing nearer to God. I drew further from God. And God was not sufficient for me. And God was reminding me, as for me, you're sufficient. I will exchange even my own son. Stop delaying. If you're in this room this morning, if you're studying the Bible, if you're even contemplating the, the possibility of maybe getting more committed with God, stop deferring it. Then and only then will we increase. What are you willing to exchange? When we increase our perspective, we will increase our commitment. Go to Genesis 17. Genesis 17. I'm telling you, repentance is refreshing. The Lord has been working on me. Genesis 17, let's pick it up where we left off. In 17 verse 9. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant. You and your descendants after you for the generations to come. Verse 10. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not of your offspring, whether born in your household or bought with your money. They must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who, is, who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God here with Abraham said, look, I already explained to you what my end of the bargain is going to be. As for you, here's what I need you to focus on. I'm going to keep my covenant. I'm going to be faithful. I am trustworthy. Keep my covenant and teach it to others to do the same. You know, covenant is not a word we often use nowadays. A covenant is simply a contract, a binding agreement. It's like marriage, a very special relationship. 
God says, here is the sign. Here is the token of the covenant. Every male among you, Abraham, shall be circumcised. Now, when Abram is listening to this and he gets this text message from God, he reads it and he goes, amen, amen. So he gets on the man's group me. Uh, uh, my dear brothers, uh, here's a special announcement for midweek. Um, uh, everyone, uh, BYOK, bring your own wife. W uh, not your wife, bring your own knife. And the brothers are really like, uh, all right, what, what is about to happen here? But then God sends him another text message. And in verse 11 says, Abraham, you are under to undergo it as well. You know in the, when you have an iPhone, if you have an iPhone, you can press a, a, your finger on it and it, it has like special effect. You have to like, maybe it's, it comes a little fuzzy, like a special effect. that you. And, and I can see, imagine Abraham putting his, like, did I read that? God, can you run that by me one more time? Send a couple emojis with it of confusion. <laughs> For Abraham, it just got real. See, there are things that God wants you to go through. It might not be what you want to go through. It might not be when you want to go through them or how you want to go through them, but God wants you to go through it. Why did he do this? So he can influence and grow. Not only that, but so he can relate. So he can model commitment through it. What power is it if he calls all the other guys to do it and he himself does not show his commitment to God? For those who want to be in a relationship with God and a covenant with God, it was the same expectation, the same level of commitment from an 8-day-year-old boy to a 99-year-old guy. If God was to be their God, they needed to learn to have a level of commitment in their life. That set absolutely no limits. You know, inherently as people, we value commitment. We actually applaud it. Whether it be in academics, in business, or in sports, society salutes them. We stand up to applaud them. We hold them in high esteem. You know, this is why in a very big reason many people loved Kobe Bryant. Because he modeled commitment. In an interview with one of, uh, regarding one of his teammates, he was quoted saying the following. I saw you come in. And I wanted you to know that it doesn't matter how hard you work. That I'm willing to work harder than you. Now this was commitment to the sport of basketball. How about... What should be the level of commitment towards our covenant relationship with the Lord? Here's the thing. It's going to take work. It's going to take hard work. Some of you who are single want to get married one day, amen. Uh, Nick got angry at that. He didn't want to get married. Look at that. I don't think he heard me. Like, I'm not getting married, man. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Even in the kingdom, there is no guarantee that you're going to have a vibrant, successful, healthy, spiritual marriage. It's going to take work. Hard work. There's no greater time, I believe, that we are tempted to set limits on God and our commitment to God than during this time. When we begin to close out the year. There's a temptation to slow down. There's a temptation to chill and just coast into the new year. God was saying to Abraham, as for me, I am going to follow through with my commitments. Don't worry about me. 
I will ensure you, Abraham, greatly increase. The question is whether you and I will follow through with our commitment. How far would Abraham obey? When it came time that it personally affected him, would he then slow down? Would he wiggle out of the responsibility God was putting before him? The promise had been set. He will be the father of many nations. But this incredible promise would never come to fruition unless Abraham was willing to be totally committed. Like Abraham, we all desire to be used by God. I'm sure that all of us say, who wants to be used by God to the greatest degree to impact the nations? Every hand goes up. Like Abraham, we must be willing to do and go through what God calls us to do, even if it seems unreasonable. Even if it seems unfair. If this is God's will for my life, then I will embrace it. This is the commitment he wants me to live through. This has been my life the past month and a half. All right, well, let, me, let me just do the math here, God. Uh, we're crossing new barriers in the church. Uh, we got plans for the next three, five years of how we're going to get to all the Metroplex, to all of Texas. I'm ready, locked and loaded. Once I get the green light from our dear movement leader, and we're going to go send out the team to all of Texas. And then why would you put a limitation to me now? It's unreasonable. Makes no sense. When it personally affects me. God says, I need you to go undergo it. I need you to model commitment. So that nations can be reached. So that the masses can be influenced. So you can stop being an exalted father and be the father of many nations. Remember, God does not change. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Jesus going about doing ministry work will show us the same spirit that Abraham saw in God. In verse 57, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. Man, that's an open guy. If you're ever questioning whether this person was open, man, he was open. He's like, I got, I got Bibles, man. Like, I'm ready to go. I'll do a Bible study right now. Anywhere you're going, I'm going. Jesus replied, foxes have holes. Birds in the air have nests. The son of man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. So another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. The first guy he comes across with, he's fired up. He's excited. He's like, hey, let's go. Like, how many services have we got today? Is this it? We got to get the 4 o'clock, the 3 o'clock, the Spanish service? Like, I'll, I'll be there. I'll bring more toys. I'll set up the Christmas tree. Like, I'm in, man. Jesus says, look, let me help you understand a little bit. You know those foxes? They got holes. See that little birdie right there? See that nest? He's got that nest. The son of man, I don't even have a place to lay my head. I don't have a home. I don't have a pillow. You better count the cost. You want to really follow me? It's going to cost you something. At this point, 
the guy's like, um, and we never hear from the guy again. Sadly, today, Christianity cost us nothing. Religious leaders today know that they've built a culture of church attendance, but not true Christianity. In the biggest disservice to humankind from this perspective is that people walk in believing and thinking and walking out that they're actually following Jesus because they sat on a seat. Jesus says, I don't even have a place to lay my head. This is a level of commitment. Not for like first century, guys. This is true Christianity. Total commitment to Jesus. You're like, okay, I mean, does that mean I throw away my pillow this afternoon? I mean, what, 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 what do I do here? Like, I mean, should I downsize from the king to the queen size mattress? Um, should it, I have a, you know, those, you know, those pillows that kind of wrap around your head. Is that, is that wrong? Do, should I sleep on a board? Like, what, what, what does that mean? Here's the barometer. Are you comfortable being uncomfortable? How are we going to get this church to 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, and the thousands? I'm not in no business here to build a mega church where people come and fill seats. I need to build God's church the way Jesus built it. The second guy, he tells them, hey, you, me, yeah, yeah, you, follow me. He goes, oh, yeah, sure, I mean, but, hey, but let me first go bury my father. Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. You go proclaim the kingdom of God. I always viewed this passage from the perspective of, well, the guy's father died. Why not just go bury the father and come back? But then I also thought about it this way. It's possible that the father hadn't died yet. What if tomorrow at your job, your boss comes in and he goes, you know what? Gio, I'm super proud of you. Uh, you've been working so hard. You've been like, man, there's no employee better than Gio Morales. Here's what I want to do for you. This is my Christmas gift to you. I want to promote you. I want to give you a considerable raise. But in order to do that, I need to relocate you to Iceland. He looks at his boss and he says, well, how about I once have buried my father? <laughs> Meaning what? I actually value the proposition. I'm intrigued by it. I I'm encouraged by it. Thank you for picking me. Just not now. It's not that valuable enough for me to drop everything and do it now. See, everything comes down to a value system. The timing is off, he says. Right now, just so you understand, I got three more days of finals. Like, getting into Bible studies, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, I got to go hit the books. Maybe, 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 like, I'm not, like, against it. How about after I graduate? Okay, so after I graduate, I'm really going to commit myself to the Lord. I'm really going to go after it. So I, I, I'm going to graduate. I said, well, you know, I, I mean, I, now I gotta, I'm a single professional now. I, I, I got to put this degree that I'm in like $30,000, $40,000 in debt. I got to put it to work now. 
Once I get a career, I'm established, then I'm going to do it. Well, you know, I, I, I mean, working a lot of hours. I mean, once I'm married, once I'm married, I'm really going to commit myself to God. Well, you know, I mean, I'll do it now, but then my wife wants me home and this, this, and that. Once we have kids. For Jesus, he expected nothing else to take precedence over him. Absolutely nothing. And he's interesting, he correlates following him with proclaiming the kingdom. Therefore, for a Christian, evangelism is at the very core of who we are. There is no such concept as a Christian who does not evangelize. A Christian who does not proclaim the kingdom of God. I've heard stuff being in the great metroplex. Well, that's the pastor job, isn't it? It's the pastor's job to go and share the gospel with people. This is Jesus trying to outline what it really means to follow him. He says, you stop what you're doing and you go proclaim the kingdom. The third guy, he says, look, let me just go back and say goodbye to my family. So now is it that Jesus is against family? That doesn't make any sense. Jesus, he was against the idea of going backward. Jesus was going in one direction. He was moving forward. He was increasing. He was growing. The guy wants to go backward. See, the reason why some of us are not more effective at the Christian walk. Because we're so stuck living in the past stuff. And you get stuck there again and again. Or you get stuck in the past in general. Everything's about what I did yesterday. Like, man, those glory days. Man, I was 21, man. Like, shh. I was, man, you should have seen me. I was like fired up, man. I was like Bible studies. I was this, I was that. And I got the waters of baptism. Man, I was preaching. I was like, man, you should have seen me. When we're perpetually living in the past, you're never going to move forward. Whether your past is good or your past is not good. For some of us, we almost wish this year never existed. That if we could redo 2021, we would have it redone, erased from history. Let's just go straight into 2022. Whether it was a great year for you or a bad year for you, either way, it's time for us to get unstuck and increase our level of commitment. I've never seen someone who is plowing a field plow a straight line while looking over his shoulder. Forget what's behind. Forget it. It's behind. And strain, the Bible says. Put effort, press on to what's ahead. I believe this level of commitment that Jesus is redefining here for those of its kind is being modeled by this mighty church. I see it in you. I want to lift up a particular couple, and this is the Melendeses. Yeah. Last August, we sat down to talk about their kingdom dreams. And at the moment, the faith needed them growing to do. But through prayer, they both expressed wanting to go into the ministry. I shared with them that Jackie and I would do everything in our power to help them get there. But they need to step out in faith and have no limits. And they agreed. So we talked about, right after that, 
Yeah, strike with the iron's hot, amen. <laughs> hey, guys, we need to uh, get a footing at TCU. We don't have a strong footing there. We need to have a presence there. We need to share the gospel there. How about, I know you work full time and have a demanding job and you uh, got your master's. You can go back to the secular world and she had taken a break from her job, uh, Paulina. How about if both of you go to TCU as unpaid interns? You're like, to lead it? No, 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 not to lead it. Just to train. Just to train. No, no, nothing promised. Just to train. They're like, okay. Quickly, that ministry began to grow. In January of this year, we said, all right, guys, how about now you lead this Bible talk? Still unpaid, still with a demanding job, and that ministry multiplied yet again. In one semester, that Bible talk doubled. During the summer, we expressed that we really needed to build UTA to be the model campus ministry in Texas. And that this is where we would want them to continue their training. Without hesitation, they not only accepted, but they moved from somewhere a little further past Fort Worth, sold their home, and moved themselves to the Great Arlington area to be leaders at UTA. <laughs> Throughout this year and a few months, under their leadership, God has multiplied and they've seen 24 people get added to the kingdom as a result of their influence. Mind you, all of this not being full-time in the ministry. The Melendez have laid down their lives. They're some of the original mission team members that started this church. As we know, they've recently gotten pregnant. Yet, despite the timing of it, Hugo is willing to leave his well-paying job in the tech industry. Paulina is willing, despite having a graduate degree, not go back into the secular world. They could live pretty well off. But even those things are true, they're even willing to sell their Tesla to go into the ministry. And that's a nice car. Maybe they should donate it to one of the college students. It's without question. It is without question that God Almighty has stamped their ministry. They've proven themselves faithful. Committed to do anything and everything to save this lost world. Therefore, I put this before the family this morning. That we do it us an obligation to put this couple in the full-time ministry as quickly as possible. I believe that if we all raise our weekly contribution by just $10... We can see this couple full-time in the ministry. What does this mean for you and I? A Starbucks drink and a pastry. Imagine what they've done not being in the full-time ministry. Being divided with work and everything else. What if they could dedicate themselves exclusively to the full-time ministry, I am confident that we will see not just what they've done, but even greater things. Let's put this couple, let's raise our pledges, and let's put them in the ministry. We have 19 days left for 2021. I want to challenge you to commit to one decision. Maybe for you, as you need to pray one hour every single day. Maybe for you is you need to share with at least one person every day. Maybe if you're visiting, you need to decide this week, I'm going to study the Bible at least once every day. As we increase our commitments, 
so will our vision also increase. Let's wrap up here in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Let's close here in verse 16. Therefore the promise comes by faith. So it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. It is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. And so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. The Bible says here that this promise, that God made to Abraham is available to you and to me. It is by God's incredible grace, but it is through your faith. You and I have access to the power that God allowed Abraham to have in his life to turn nothing into something. This morning, yes, God is saying, look at the facts in your life. Look at your character flaws. Look at your weaknesses. Look at this past week. Look at your life challenges. But I can turn nothing into something. And you can as well if you believe that I can. This morning I want to call you to increase your vision. Of what God wants to see happen in your life. Push the envelope. And don't waver in unbelief. And what will be the result? You and I will be strengthened in our faith. But more importantly, we will give glory to God through it. Imagine if we all made one decision. All the disciples in the Texas churches made a decision of faith and said, I am going to save at least one person in 2022 we would have by the end of 2022 over 400 disciples in the great state of texas as we go into the christmas holiday cherish your time with your family but listen also to the voice of the spirit as today we begin to set course of what we're going to do next year. Today, increase your perspective. Today, increase your commitment. Today, we choose to increase our vision. I believe that our greatest history in this church is before us. It is a blank canvas and God is handing us the pen. But yet he's written the first sentence in that canvas which reads, as for me, you will greatly increase. To God be the glory. Amen.